Want to patent your invention? The chance is near. You've given it heart. Now get it in gear. It's Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. This is Richard Gearhart and Elizabeth Gearhart. Welcome to Passage to Profit, a show about entrepreneurs and new businesses and the intellectual property tools they need. And intellectual property is actually an umbrella term that encompasses patents, trademarks, and copyrights. And these are an important foundation to any business, any new business that you're starting. Gearhart Law, our sponsor, is a leading intellectual property law firm serving the tri-state area that focuses exclusively on intellectual property and specializes in helping on entrepreneur ventures get off to a great start. Remember, patents protect inventions, trademarks protect brands, and copyrights protect artistic works. You need your intellectual property to get off to a good start, and don't let someone else steal your millions. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Get the right intellectual property protection. And so tonight, we have as our guest, Tony Vengrove. A true passion of Tony's is to coach, mentor, speak, and train about what it really takes to lead innovation. Warren Bennis once said, there are two ways of being creative. One can sing or dance, or one can create the environment in which singers and dancers flourish. Using his idea climate equation and the seven C's of creative leadership frameworks, Tony helps leaders and organizations learn how to walk the innovation talk and create conditions for ideas to transform into successful innovations. So welcome, Tony. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about how you inspire leadership and how your programs work. Well, my background is in big New York City ad agencies. I used to work here in Manhattan before I moved out to Connecticut. Then I worked in uh, corporate uh, marketing groups and corporate innovation groups. And I quickly became very curious about why it was so difficult for a good idea to get through a corporate bureaucracy. And I became insanely geeky about it. Is that because of jealousy or of other people or what? what, what My interest in it? No, 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 no. But why they have a tough time getting through. Well, I, I think it's because most organizations are addicted to logic. So a lot of what got... Uh, folks to the C-suite was not always their creativity. It was being able to manage very analytical business systems to generate EPS that they would hit quarter after quarter after quarter and get their big bonuses. And then all of a sudden, uh, somebody like me would kind of schlep in with a PowerPoint deck with this absurd, crazy idea, and they would look at me like I'm crazy. And and so so that there's this kind of no cl- wonder you became an entrepreneur. Exactly. <laughs> but that's you know but that's where this uh, this tension exists. It's like you know a lot of the corporate leaders have a cognitive map in terms of like how their business model works, and when creative ideas come in, sometimes that is just too disruptive for their model and they just reject it because it doesn't it doesn't fit in with how they think the world works. I understand that completely. Richard and I are both corporate refugees and, um, <laughs> and we saw a lot of great ideas whether and die in corporate. Um, so you left the corporate world to start your own ventures? Yes, I first started my own marketing and innovation consulting business called Miles Finch Innovation. And then uh, when we moved, uh, I moved, I was, happened to be in Richmond, Virginia at the time when that happened. Uh, and then when we moved back to our home state in Connecticut, I opened a co-working space to really attract more startup culture in the northwest part of our state. And so tell us a little bit about how that's been going. Well, uh, both have been going great. The, my firm has been around longer, so I have some great, wonderful clients uh, up and down the East Coast. Most of them now are in Connecticut because of the co-working space. The co-working space is about two years old. And really our mission there, because we're a more rural market rather than, do, than doing co-working in a big urban market, uh, our strategy is to pull all this kind of wonderful creative talent that's hiding out in the shadows of the Litchfield Hills and pull them out of their house where they're working alone in isolation, which isn't good for creativity, get them around a common table where we can work together, inspire each other, lift each other up, network, et cetera, et cetera. And we're having some great success. We have a great cohort of members. It kind of rotates here and there. And then we do a whole bunch of entrepreneurial events, and there's a lot more we have planned. And what's the name of the space? Makery Coworking. Did I forget to say that? (laughs) (laughs) That's okay. That's what we're here for. (laughs) So could you describe for our listeners what a coworking space is? Sure. They're quite popular and trendy, a little over 10 years old as a concept. But basically, it's a shared office environment, Uh, a little less corporate as some of the uh, shared office spaces that existed before coworking came around. 
but they're, they're generally meant and designed to be much more open, collaborative, and feel like you're in that entrepreneurial garage, so to speak. And right. you can buy time you know, on a day pass, partial month, full month. It's very flexible. Uh, you have all the amenities you need to come in and be productive. So you can come in, grab a seat. There's phone rooms, rent the conference room, free coffee, and lots of fun. So if you get stuck on a problem, you can go out into the co-working space and say, hey, has anybody thought about this? Anybody got any ideas for me? Yeah, I tend to do that myself as, you know, my main business is marketing. So sometimes if I'm struggling with a line or a piece of copy, I can, you know, tap somebody, say, hey, do you have a second to take a look at this? That's really great. So describe some of the businesses that are in the co-working space. Sure, we have a nice mix. A lot of them are technology-based right now. So we have some web developers. We have work-from-home software people that work for a company located in another state. We've had attorneys, business coach. We have a wonderful uh, startup called Career Path Mobile, and they have a mobile-based app solution for students to engage with career planning in universities. Um, and we have a wonderful nonprofit called Robotics and Beyond, and they do STEM education and robotics programming for, for kids in our town. So it's a nice mix. Yeah, it sounds great. So it's a kind of a mixture of startups and also people who are working for other companies, but they want to get out of the house and they can work in your space and enjoy some collaboration, but also people who are creating their own businesses. Yes. You know, all of the above. And I think the thing that is the common denominator is regardless of what type of business you're in, if you need to have any kind of creative thinking, there's only so much you can really do, in my opinion, alone in isolation. You really just need that stimulation of other people, uh, conversations. You never know when a synapse is going to form that, you know, creates that aha moment where uh, you got to, you know, something new and novel to pursue. So you came to us through Kevin Lane. He was on the show, boy, I can't remember when, a few months ago. Kevin Lane had this new device for making sandcastles that was just going crazy. Everybody loves it, and he's been doing so well ever since. We want to have him back on as a huge success story. So what did you and Kevin do together? Like, What did he get from the co-working space? Kevin is a dear friend of mine. We were neighbors before I moved down to Richmond, Virginia. So when I came back, he told me about this idea for Create a Castle, and my eyes just lit up uh, because I just thought it was such a, a neat, novel idea. And he's, he was, did a wonderful job, you know, talking about IP of kind of protecting that idea, pursuing it and executing it to where he is now. Um, Kevin actually is, um, it's probably not the best example of co-working because he's not, uh, he, he tends to, uh, to, to be traveling a lot these days. <laughs> yeah. But a lot of my relationship with Kevin is just a, a lot of advisory role and kind of help coach where, where he is as he comes to strategic forks in the road. It's, you know, he's in a very exciting, active, dynamic space right now with a lot of people approaching him about opportunities. So he's trying to figure out how to navigate this exciting time for his business. You mentioned, or we mentioned in the introduction, about uh, your idea climate equation. As I mentioned earlier, I had this kind of uh, fascination with uh, the corporate culture around innovation and creativity. So I was uh, reading a book one day and I had this epiphany about what was kind of a a struggle of mine at the particular time and and an equation formed in my head, which I've called the idea climate equation. So I'll, I'll say it slowly so you can picture it in your head. An idea climate is equal to creativity raised to the power of belief divided by logic raised to the power of doubt. So if you ponder what's happening in that equation, essentially all it's suggesting is that there's a tension between creativity and logic. So the more logic you have in an organization, the more that's going to cut into creativity. And the exponents are critically important because when there's belief and when an employee base has belief in a company vision, it just enhances the creativity. They become this organic problem-solving group that just believes and they're fixing problems before anybody's going to ask them. Doubt is equally Uh, powerful, but it can be dangerous because when people don't believe and have doubt, they will just use any form of logic, any piece of history to make any new idea feel foolish and uh, silly. So, So I use that equation to talk about and diagnose what's happening in a particular company's culture. Wow, that is really powerful, and I I agree with all of your comments there. I think doubt can kill a lot of great ideas, and having an organization that is really on board with belief in what the organization is doing can contribute so much just to the whole energy of the institution and the work atmosphere 
and at the end of the day, the productivity too. So that's really a fantastic concept. So we're coming to the end of our segment. We'll be right back after this. You're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gearhart Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gearhart Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed, and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit GearHeartLaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. We're going to continue our discussion with Tony Vengrove, and then we'll have three entrepreneurs pitching their businesses. They'll have two minutes to pitch and six minutes to answer questions from Tony, Elizabeth, and myself. And don't worry, we've discussed the intellectual property situation with each of our pitchers this evening before allowing them to pitch. Uh, We didn't want them to spill the beans too soon and allow somebody else to scoop up their idea. And make all the money off it. (laughs) So after the pitches, your listeners can go to the Passage to Profit page at GearHeartLaw.com and vote for your favorite pitch. That's GearHeartLaw, G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T. L-A-W. You can vote for a week, but you only get to vote once. So the people that are pitching need to get their friends to come and vote for them so they get lots of votes. And don't forget to like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can remember the name of the show by imagining you're walking down a passage with a huge pot of gold at the end. Passage to Profit. And may your passage be short and your profit be huge. So let's continue our discussion with Tony now. Over the break, Tony, we were talking about the seven C's of leadership. Can you tell us about that? Sure. I developed the seven C's of creative leadership coming out of the idea climate equation because I felt like there's certain behaviors and traits that leaders need to focus on as they're leading uh, innovation and leading creativity in their organization. And I won't go through all uh, seven of them, but the first one is communication. So I mentioned belief and visioning. And really, a creative leader has to really articulate and demonstrate to their organization that they, without a doubt, believe in their vision. And the road towards accomplishing that vision might be unknown. It might be hard. There might not be a clear path on how to get there, but it's worthy of trying and day after day working closer to getting there. Communication is also very important when it comes to leading by objectives. And so I'm a big proponent of giving your employees, giving your teammates objectives to solve rather than trying to solve the problems themselves. My father was a New York City ad copywriter and creative director, and he kind of inspired me, as you might have guessed. Uh, One of his most famous campaigns was, Oh, What a Feeling for Toyota back in the 80s and the Toyota Jump. I know that one, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, As you might expect, there were some just wonderful things happening uh, during those years, but when that campaign was created, it was just, oh, what a feeling without a jump. And so when they flew out to California to pitch it to the client, they loved it. They went around the room and everybody said, want to do it, let's move forward. And then the last person was probably the most senior person in the room said, I love it too, I want to go, but there's one thing I want you to think about at the end of the commercial. It's just a static, boring shot of a car and it just says, oh, what a feeling. Can you visualize what, oh, what a feeling feels like? And that's a fantastic objective. And my father said, I get it. It's a great objective. I don't have an answer. We'll get back to you. So they fly back home. And at that time, I must have been like 12 or 13 years old. And we had just taken in a stray dog with a Kelly. And she looked like this uh, whippet, black, greyhound mix of some sort. And I was convinced she was going to be the next Frisbee dog champion in the world. So after lunch, I took her out in the backyard. And I, after two throws, missed through it, hit her. As it came down, she kind of yelped, and after that, she would let the Frisbee land before she picked it up, and so I was a huge failure. But it was too early to go back in the house, so I was bored, you know, so I held the Frisbee up in the air and she, to see how high Kelly could jump. And as she was jumping up in the air for the Frisbee, my father looked out the window, 
Eureka. And, he's, and he's like, that's, that's what, oh, what a feeling feels like. So did Kelly get any airtime in the commercial? <laughs> no. <laughs> Although my father did use my name in one of the commercials. I forget which one. But, uh, oh, cool. Uh, that would be uh, awesome. And, and, our fam- and, and, and the Vengrove name in another. So it was, so it was pretty fun. But, but one of those key lessons, especially for founders and, and, and founders with a vision of what they think their startup is, as you start hiring and bringing people in, the point of bringing people in and building a team isn't just to spread work, it's to build a bigger collective brain. And the more you empower your employees to be working off objectives, the more they might come up with solutions that are better than anything you could have come up with. I think that is so true. I'm doing the marketing at Gearheart Law and we brought in an accountant and I had her read some copy I'd written for a blog, and she had this super good idea. And I'm like, why did anybody else ever think about this? <laughs> <laughs> so she said, why don't you have a glossary of patent terms that un- people can understand and just so we can go refer to that when we're looking at this stuff? And it's like, why didn't we ever think of that? Yeah. The outside perspective, sometimes it's so easy to get in your own bubble, right? But I, I love the story because when you say, oh, what a feeling, there are so many feelings. And if you don't put that exclamation point <laughs> at the end of it, people might get the wrong idea, right? Yeah, so, that's a good point. Um, you know, very powerful commercial. And those ads ran for a long time, right? So what are some of the other C's of leadership? The next one is curiosity. So that, you know, the communication of that vision, the objective should inspire some curiosity. So you want people to always be curious, tinkering. Uh, you should build a culture where it's okay to get out of the office and let somebody go spend some time in a museum just to get inspired of all the cool things happening outside of the office and happening in the world. Because you need to f- kind of foster the conditions f- like the like the jump right. for th- this serendipity to happen. Right. Um, it doesn't always happen, but why not increase the odds of it happening? Right. So, uh, so curiosity is a big one. Creativity is an, is another huge one. Culture change management, and the last one is uh, courage. Right. To do all this, it just takes courage. It takes risk. Uh, to be creative, to be an innovator, to be an entrepreneur, you have to have confidence knowing that you're venturing into unknown territory. And especially if you're in a, in a corporate environment, uh, you know, as I was being a director of innovation, I, you know, I'm venturing into new territory. And I, I needed the confidence in myself to know that I'm not exactly sure where we're going, but I think we're going to get there all the while reporting into senior executives that wanted to know exactly where I was going and how much money was all going to make. Getting back to the equation, those are two different mindsets. And sometimes you just need that courage to not listen to everything the naysayers are saying or everybody that's challenging you and just proceed because you just believe that there's something there on the other side. So I just can't say that how much I really love when people talk about courage and entrepreneurism. And I've often said that entrepreneurism is courage in executing innovation because you really, to be an effective entrepreneur, you have to have courage, you have to execute, and you have to be innovative. And so I think that that's a key part of the entrepreneurial mindset. So I'd like to add, I don't think we would have any of the stuff that I'm looking at in this room today if somebody hadn't had the courage to go out of the box and make it. And we see so many of those people that are applying for patents. And the thing is that you have to pay for that courage at some point. You have to sell something. And if you make something really cool and you don't have the protection, then your competitor can just scoop it up and it's all she wrote. Absolutely. The whole purpose of intellectual property is to try to protect the investment that you've made in the creativity. So it's having an idea, then developing it, and then making sure that it stays proprietary for you and your company so that your investment and efforts can be uh, rewarded. And there's lots of different ways that things can be protected. If it's technology, it's through patents. If it's branding, it's through trademarks. And then if it's an artistic expression, it's through uh, copyright. Mm -hmm. And so we think that it's important for entrepreneurs to be aware of those tools to maximize their chances for success. So did it take a lot of courage for you to leave the big New York ad agencies and go off on your own? I don't think that was quite as the courageous leap of leaving my cushy corporate job to be start up my own entrepreneurial endeavors. It's hard to leave that paycheck that comes every two weeks and the bonuses, but I would not go back. It's just having the freedom and the empowerment to really pursue my dreams and passions is just, it, you can't put a price tag on that. Right. And yeah. so often in large companies, they do so much valuable work, but they really need to be organized in a way 
where they're very selective about how they work with creativity. Everybody says that they want to have creativity, but it's much harder in, in big companies. You know, I experienced it firsthand. It's, it's hard and it's frustrating because you feel like you're onto something and sometimes things get shut down because you can't prove the value in them because they're so new and novel. And so they kind of get shelved and three or four years later, they pop up outside of the company someplace because people figured out how to do it. I think that when that happens, that also that kind of puts a ding on, on the company's culture because everybody knows there was work happening in that area, but they didn't make it happen. And then there's this perception of like, they wouldn't know a good idea if they you know, slapped them in the face. Yeah, and a lot of companies, they acquire an interest in an entrepreneurial ventures and keep it separate from the company just so those things don't happen. So the company doesn't get suffocated and they can continue to innovate. And then when it gets to the right point, they bring it inside. So there's lots of different ways to do it, but it's another example of why the entrepreneurial ecosystem is so important because it's not just beneficial to the entrepreneurs, but to a lot of larger organizations, larger companies that need the technology and uh, the innovation that they can't get internally. Certainly, uh, there's, I think, an opportunity that kind of make some progress. Yeah, absolutely. So fascinating conversation, Tony. This is Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt on iHeartRadio with Passage to Profit. WOR 710, the voice of New York. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearheart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at GearheartLaw.com. At Gearheart Law, we have years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at Gearheart Law, www.gearheartlaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. Together, we can change the world. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Well, welcome back, listeners. And now for the pitches. Remember, at the end of the program, to go to the Passage to Profit page on the Gearhart Law website, where you can vote for the pitch that you like the best. And while you're there, if you want to know more about what we're talking about with intellectual property, we have a lot of great resources there and a lot of information about intellectual property and how it can help your business. So what we say on the program is not legal advice. The website's not legal advice, but it has a lot of good advice. You really need to talk to an attorney when the time comes. So we are ready for our first pitch. Gil Barlev, uh, full disclosure, he's the client of the firm. Welcome, Gil. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. My name is Gil Barlev, and I represent Home Roots. The wholesale of furnishing products today uh, did not change much over the past couple decades um, I mean, if you wish to bootstrap the sale of your products, you need to say goodbye to a few hundreds of thousands of dollars annually, if not even more, in order to exhibit in one or two trade shows year after year. Uh, now, if you wish to purchase these products, you will come back from the same trade shows with fixed catalogs with near, from a nearby suppliers who are located ge- um, geographically. And, and you'll find that flipping through the catalog pages and finding exactly what you want and figuring out the cost of freight won't be an easy task. Okay. If you want to sell those products online, you'll need to work with Excel files that come in different shapes and forms from representatives that will offer little or no assistance in getting it to your actual website. And consumers are the ones who suffer the most because they get an inferior or an incomplete product listing with an uncertain inventory. Uh, now, I'd like you to explore outside and dream of a new world in which one in the foreign country can penetrate the U.S. market in an equivalent market share in a short amount of time with a small investment of only a few thousand dollars or even hundreds of dollars. I'd like you to imagine that one does not need to limit the products that are interested in and they can find it easily in a website that has elevated experience than any direct-to-consumer website you are familiar with today. I would like you to imagine that one can have these products for sale on your website in a click of a button with all that the consumer needs in order to make a smart buying decision. Imagine that you place an order for a furniture piece 
and receive it the same day or the following without worrying where the product is coming from around the world and in a land that costs lower than you can ever imagine. Now, come back inside, come home. There is a new reality and there's no longer a need to dream. It's called Home Roots. Thank you. Wow. Wow. That is innovative and out of the box. So it's a B2B or B2C business? Uh, we're a B2B business. Okay. So if I had a furniture business and I wanted to stock my stock room, I would come to you? If you want to sell your products okay. to the trade, you will come to us. If you're interested in buying and reselling it, you will come to us as well. So our buyers are either interior designers, we have builders, we have e-commerce companies, brick and mortar stores. And at the end of the day, if you are a licensed business and you're interested in furnishing your office or your working space or your home or any of your employees, you will come to us to find what you're looking for. We have a website, e, like an e, big e-catalog, uh, which you'll have to register. We'll have to vet you, make sure that you're a licensed business. And then the gates are open. We have unlimited access to inventory, and it just keeps on increasing and increasing from one month to another. That's great. So how many vendors do you have on the website right now? So at the moment, we have about 25 active vendors. But the challenge that we're facing, that we have more than 200 that want to come on board from different places in the world uh, with more than access to a million different products. We're behind on our schedule, and we have a huge backlog. Um, and that's what's holding us back. Um, if we had all the manpower that we need in the moment, I can assure you we will already have everything available. Uh, we do get inquiries, and even if it's not of online right now, we do get access to those products, and we we share this information right now offline, so at least you know people can transact and get what they want in a lower cost, and um, or finish up their development projects, whatever they need to do. We're keeping things moving forward. And so the vendors that can sign up, they're you, I think you said they're global. Yes, we have domestic importers that we started off with, and now we're getting requests from international manufacturers who wants to send their merchandise to us in containers, in consignment to our warehouses, and we will become their launch pod for all their U.S. penetration market. We will sell to the big box stores. We will sell to the e-commerce, to the trade. We will be their full white glove service as far as selling their goods. And, you know, we're, we handle the customer support, we handle the accounts payable, the accounts receivable, um, all the entry into the U.S., the, dis the local distribution, the warehousing. We give them every everything. They're pretty much, I can tell you that the risks that they're taking now in working with us is, is slim compared to how it's done until now in the industry. You know, we got a sofa and we had to wait three months to get it. <laughs> now I wish us. they would have used we're, your we're sofa. ready to move out of the house by the time we got the sofa. This well, is over. Those days are over. <laughs> well, uh, are you acquiring the inventory once a business places an order, or are you building inventory uh, so it's your warehousing in the U.S. and then shipping it out as the orders go? So, so we work in two models. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a consignment basis where we're offering our vendors to pretty much places their merchandise in our facilities, mm -hmm. and then we fulfill it from our facilities as per needs. And once we sell it, we basically, you know, pay them uh, services. We do have some job shipping uh, services as well, meaning if, if we're off here or there and we need to complement it in order to place this in order, then we'll work something with our vendors to kind of find an alternative. But a lot of it is really done on a consignment basis mm -hmm. uh, from our own facilities. That's great. So, Gil, this is a show about intellectual property, and you're mm -hmm. a client of our Gerhardt Law uh, intellectual property firm. Uh, headquartered in Summit, New Jersey, with <laughs> offices in oh. New York and Pennsylvania. Uh, a little shameless self-promotion there, but you got a trademark from us. So yes, tell us yes, a I little do. bit about that process and some of the challenges that occurred when you were sure. getting the trademark. Sure. So we, we were looking for a name that one will feel close to their heart and something that will give them warmth, warmth and, and security in dealing with us. So, you know, we came up with the name. Um, obviously, we did uh, a research to make sure it's not being occupied by someone else. Uh, the challenge was that we saw the name out there when we Google it, but it was not in our category. Uh, so we're able to definitely file the, the trademark and move forward. 
when we agreed on the name and we want to move forward, the marketing designers, developers, business plan, everybody wants to move forward, but the trademark is not yet there, right? Though this process takes months, but we kept on moving forward, kept on pushing. Um, finally, it arrived and we moved forward. So how many different names did you consider and what did you finally decide on? So we had three names uh, that we came up with. It really started off with what we were doing now when we picked the name and who's the clientele and what type of products that we're selling. Uh, so we're looking for something that will resonate with uh, what we're promoting right now on our site. And so that name was chosen first. And with keeping the door open for the other two names just to represent different types of business model that will come in the hopefully near future. So I think you brought up the point that people don't always realize about trademarks. You don't get to just say, I want this trademark, and oh, boom, you got it, right? It has to go to the United <laughs> States Patent and Trademark Office, yes. and you have to fight for it sometimes, right? Yes. Yeah, we, we have to do a lot of um, research and to prove that we're actually using the name. The business already started. It was just that we had to wait, and then, uh, again, we were asked to provide proof. And what is your website? Uh, the website is homeroots.co. Okay. I welcome everybody to check it out. And if you're a business, whether you want to sell or buy, you're welcome to register. Great. So you're listening to Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart with our special guest, Tony Vangrove, on Passage to Profit. Hi, I'm Lisa Askley, the inventress, founder, CEO, and president of Inventing A to Z. I've been inventing products for over 38 years. Hundreds of products later and dozens of patents. I help people develop products and put them on the market from concept to fruition. I bring them to some of the top shopping networks in the world. QVC, HSN, Evine Live, and retail stores. Have you ever said to yourself, someone should invent that thing? Well, I say, why not make it you? If you want to know how to develop a product from concept to fruition the right way, contact me, Lisa Askeles, the inventress. Go to Inventing A toz.com inventing a to z.com email me lisa at inventing a to z.com treat yourself to a day chock full of networking education music shopping and fun go to my website inventing a toz.com now back to passage to profit once again richard and elizabeth gearhart we're on to our second pitch this evening we're here with kathleen Edinger, and she's going to be talking about t-scape you have two minutes go Step away from the chaos of the day, make time for yourself, and enjoy the moment. This is a mantra I've embraced over the years and continue to resonate with every day. So much so that it's become the mission of my company, Teascapes, a tea brand designed to provide a welcome break in your hectic day and transport you into the oasis of relaxation. As a society, we need to make time for ourselves, indulge more often, and make the decision to nourish our health and well-being every day. When was the last time you celebrated you? Oftentimes, we get caught up in the hustle and bustle of our work and daily life, but we must remember to take time to reflect, refresh, and ultimately renew our mind, body, and soul. My name is Kathleen Edinger. I'm a former physical therapist, but most now know me and recognize me as the tea inspirista. I'm a certified tea consultant and the founder and owner of Teascapes, a tea company and lifestyle brand that creates premium, customized, loose tea blends, tea accessories, and digital uplifting content designed with luxury, gratitude, and family values in mind. Our brick-and-mortar location in Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey, offers our customers the convenience to enjoy the moment daily. Teascapes Tea Bar offers freshly brewed premium tea, a wide variety of gluten-free light fare, a relaxing retail experience, including access to our extensive tea menu, featuring our signature tea blends and tea accessories for every need. Teascapes is a much-needed escape for tea lovers and enthusiasts alike. Philanthropy and community connection are both very valuable assets to our Teascapes family. We invite small businesses, authors, musicians, artists, and more to collaborate with us. We are pleased to host on-site events, and emphasis is placed on building a strong, supportive community both online and off. Now, all you need to do is brew a fresh cup of our favorite Teascapes tea, sit back in your favorite place, and enjoy the moment. Awesome. Well, nice job. Yes. As my husband can attest, I am a tea lover. I've been drinking tea since I was a baby. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just, I love Kathleen's presentation because, I mean, it, I, I just felt so relaxed after listening to her speak. I just wanted to go out and escape someplace. 
And I'm not really a, a tea drinker, but now I really want some tea. So we everybody. <laughs> well, we have some of her tea, and it's very good. Lisa Ascalis gave us some. I yeah, I, I know, and we got we got some before the show too. So thank you. Uh, I like that's the branding really wonderful. Too. So, yeah. what motivated you to start a tea shop? Well, I was a physical therapist for 24 years, and I wanted a change in path. And my husband gave me a flowery tea for my birthday one year. And I went, this is interesting. And I started investigating the industry. I bought a trade magazine. I started looking at where the tea industry was and started sampling some different premium teas out there and realized that it was, it's been around for a very long time. And it's something that people are really starting to enjoy, particularly the millennials. Um, they're, they are half coffee, half tea. So a big population that I can definitely tap into. Do you like caffeinated or decaffeinated teas more? Um, for, it depends on what I need. I, I love green tea, but I love all sorts of different types of teas. If I need to relax, then I'll drink an herbal, which doesn't have any caffeine. But we, we have over 50 teas in our tea bar, so we have something for everybody. And um, to meet everybody's need as well. So some people can't have tea. Sometimes they can have herbal. So it really depends on the person. What's your long-term goal or vision for this? Are you looking just to maximize this one location? Are you looking to franchise this and expand? Like, what's, what It's you interesting thinking? you say that. Um, we're definitely looking to expand in the wholesale arena. My husband and I, um, he's, he's working full-time right now. But um, we're looking to really start doing more blending and expanding into that arena. Currently working on compliance for that and um, creating blends specifically for the needs of restaurants, for the food that will be exclusive for them, wineries, breweries. It's really the sky's the limit with that. And be able to spread, spread the way of tea because not everybody is aware of the really good teas that are out there. Trade secrets is an important part. Yes. And so would you say you have some special blends that people love so much that are worthy of keeping Absolutely. a lid on it? Yeah. Absolutely. We even trademarked our name, Teascapes. And we did that early on. At first we had a, uh, our, our logo was a, I bought the extended license from an artist to use her logo, but I wanted something that was mine. And so once we trademarked Teascapes, we'd created our own logo and um, are, are in the process of trademarking the entire composite mm -hmm. so that it can become ours. We were speaking before the show. You mentioned that there are other people who've tried to kind of rip off your trademark, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the attorney that I'm using right now, and I know, have you guys? You broke my <laughs> heart when you said other attorney, We didn't by the know way. you when you started. I, I didn't After know knowing you. us. I didn't know you, but I do have you. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, he, he, you know he, where to find he, us, he right? He retires, yes. Um, I, I was told by um, my attorney that um, uh, it is my obligation to protect my mark because I was like, oh, well, we can share it. And he goes, it's your obligation to protect your mark. And when he said that, I'm like, OK, they need to know we exist. Yeah. And you don't want somebody who scoops up some dirt and maybe some weeds from their yard and pretends it's tea and uses true. your name. Right. <laughs> true. It's true. Absolutely. Right. And that's why we talk about branding. We started you know, branding uh, tea tumblers and other things like that to get our brand out there. Yeah, and it's beautiful, Mark. I mean, I love I love teascapes. I mean, that is such a great word. So I can see why other people would want to uh, to try to use it. Mm -hmm. And um, trademark rights have to be enforced; otherwise, they become diluted, and you can lose your right to your trademark That's over right. time. So, if you do have a trademark, it's important to pay attention to the competitive landscape to make sure that the trademark isn't being used by somebody else. And Gearheart Law does have a watch service where we do that kind of research for our trademark owners, where we go out and we look for similar trademarks. And if there are any conflicts, then we bring them to your attention and we come up with a strategy for dealing with those. So it is important that uh, trademarks be policed. So I haven't been to your tea shop, although I love tea shops. You know, I grew up, with people who drank tea, all the women in my family, and we would go to tea shops. They're hard to find now. Mm -hmm. I saw the pictures of yours, though. Beautiful. Le that looks like such a great space to sit and drink it a is. cup it's, of tea. It's, you step off the street, and you're, st you're stepping into zen. Zen and peace. I could the, use some the zen paint, and peace. The, the painting, the colors, or the, wall, the interior designer I used, the entire team that I put together helped me create that space. It was a team effort. It wasn't just mine, but I definitely wanted to have something that people could unplug and, and just take a break. Well, it sounds great. Kathleen, where can people find you again? We're in Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey. 
right? And you have a website? I do. Um, www.enjoyteascapes.com. We're also on Facebook and Instagram at, at enjoyteascapes. That's wonderful. Thank you for joining us Thank this you. evening. It's been great having you, and for I'm sure. looking forward to some tea after the show. So <laughs> <laughs> you're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhart. We'll be right back. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gearheart Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gearheart Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs, ideas, and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed, and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit GearHeartLaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart And our special guest, Tony Vengrave. We are on to our third and final pitch, Caroline Showcup. And when I looked on her website, I was blown away. So welcome, Caroline. Hi, thank you for having me. I am the founder of It's By You. That's I-T-S-B-Y-U. And we are a DIY flower kit company, also known as a botanical therapy kit company. So what we do is we send you everything you need to make your own flower arrangements including the tools, the containers, a streaming video lesson, and the flowers directly from our farms in Ecuador and California. So we cut out all the middlemen. Uh, we pass on all the savings to our customers, and they have an amazing experience making their own flower arrangements. It's that Zen moment where you are you're lowering your stress, you're reducing blood pressure, you're creating joy in your life, and then you're experiencing for the next couple of weeks, because our flowers are so fresh, they do last two, two and a half weeks, you're experiencing this wonderful creation that you made. And the great thing about our subscriptions is that you use the same container, use the same vase over and over again, and we send you brand new curated flowers every time. So you're always learning something new. Um, along with our streaming video lesson, you get a digital guide telling you what the flowers are, where they're from, who grew them, when they were cut. So you're learning all about biology and you're learning about all these flowers that you never maybe knew about before. And you're always getting a different look, but you're using the same container. So it's not like we're filling your house with, with stuff. And uh, people are using our kits in all sorts of different ways. Yeah, I think this is just amazing. When I saw it, I was like, oh, my gosh, I wish my mother was alive because mm. she would have loved that. Mm -hmm. You know, you get old, you can't garden anymore. And the flowers are a little bit exotic because Ecuador, like, yeah. Uh, just in our rose, where we source our roses from alone, they grow 130 different varietals of roses. And the cool thing about it is that this rose farm um, is the rose farm that introduces the one new rose to the world every year. These are the, uh, the guys that graft that rose over like a seven-year period, and they're always releasing something new, and they have an exclusive, a two-year exclusive on that rose, which means we have a two-year exclusive on that rose. So some really, really cool stuff coming out. What does it cost to use your service? It's about $50 a delivery, and that includes shipping. And you're getting the flowers directly from the farm. We cut out all the middlemen, including ourselves. We never actually take inventory of the product, um, which makes it extra fresh for our customers. And they have a really long life. And so do you just order one off, or can you sign up and just get a regular delivery? Yeah, you could get a one-time kit, uh, try it out, see whether you like it, or you could sign up to get uh, deliveries once a month or once every other week. So that way you always have something new and fresh in your house. So what about people like me who are florally challenged, right? <laughs> who don't know the first thing about flower arrangements, Yeah, and I wouldn't even know where to begin. Well, we call it well, we don't really have this on our website, but it's kind of kind of like flowers for dummies. Um, we have <laughs> Where our, do I sign? <laughs> <laughs> um, some of our containers actually even have holes at the top where we actually tell you show you step by step 
where to place the flowers. You can't screw it up. Like we literally have had five-year-old kids make our arrangements. Is it fun? I mean, is this like a, speaking of kids, I mean, this might be something you want to do with your kids, right? Yeah, uh, we actually, well, we actually do have kits for kids coming out a little bit later this year. We have some really cool things in mind. But what we really want to do is uh, bring people back to nature, bring nature into people's lives on a daily basis, be it at home or at work or even at retirement communities. Uh, We have a lot of requests coming in from all sorts of different places that we hadn't even envisioned when we launched this company. And um, we really see that living in this concrete jungle that the majority of us live in now, we don't have enough access to nature. And that's actually been damaging to us physiologically and psychologically. And so we need to bring nature back into our lives. And our It's By You kits are a really easy way to do that. We work with our farms in figuring out what flowers they have available. Um, So different flowers grow at different times of year. And so my sister, Christine, is actually my co-founder. She's an award-winning flower designer. She works directly with the farms to curate beautiful designs, usually using a variety of different flowers. So you'll get at least five different varietals uh, will come in your box. And sometimes she's, you know, she's choosing flowers based on color, based on texture. She's choosing things that you've never seen before. So this is one of the things where you are now exposed to brand new, uh, brand new flowers, brand new content, and you're making something that is professionally, it, it looks like a professional did it. Um, and so we are actually curating for you. Um, and we're doing that based on nature's natural uh natural creation. So flowers, you know, flower at different times. And and so we're following their schedule. (laughs) So I think the part that is really great about this, besides anyone can do it and make it look beautiful, is you actually get all the senses involved. You get the tactile, you feel the flowers, you smell them, you see them. I don't know if you hear them. (laughs) Maybe you don't get all the senses, but I just think being able to touch the flowers and put them in, because usually when you get a bouquet, it's all stuffed together in a little thing and you just look at it. Yeah, um, we kind of see ourselves, we're entirely different from other flower companies because for us, the experience begins and the adventure begins when you open the box. It's not like, you know, usually when you receive flowers and you're like, oh, you know, Joe remembered my birthday. Isn't that great? But for us, it's most of our customers are buying for themselves and they're buying the experience. And so it's the experience of making, the experience of diving into this world. Maybe you were always, you always loved flowers. Maybe you always had dreams of maybe even becoming a florist or you, you always had the idea that you would love to take a floral class, but there's no one offering them around you. So this is almost like almost in a way like a floral class in a box. We ship all over the country, uh, continental United States, uh, directly from our farms in Ecuador and also in California, um, all via FedEx. And we use cold chain throughout the process so that way the the flowers once again have uh, an extra life. Um, When you actually receive the flowers, uh, we have um, instructions on how to condition them to make them last even longer. There are certain things that you do including, um, you know, cutting the stems at a 45 degree angle underwater with the scissors underwater as well. You'll see air bubbles coming out of the stems as the water goes into the stem. So you're learning a lot about the biology of flowers as well. I never knew that. (laughs) So Carolyn, this is such a fantastic idea. I think this is great. The time has come. It's great that you're doing this. But the patent attorney part of me is asking, you know, how can you protect this business? Now, we know you have a trademark, but can you tell us a little bit about how you plan to maintain your competitive advantage. Sure. It, it really, for us, it's all about execution. Uh, execution, operations. It took us a few years to actually figure out how to ship directly from the farms, how to even fulfill with our hard goods. So we have the vases, the shears, all of that coming to you in a separate box than the flowers do. Um, we also, my sister's skill set in constantly creating new designs. So there's that uh, that that human component as well, and truly, this is you know we're working with perishable goods. It's mm. it's not the easiest thing in the world, and so it really is about creating the team and execution, and always keeping up and up with new designs as well, because it fits with home interiors and other aspects that that we have to consider when we uh, consider a home design. I mean, it's so important because service business, especially really rely on the execution piece. And it would take somebody a long time 
to put all those pieces together in the same way that you have to be able to deliver the different designs, do it on time, do it when the flowers are fresh, do it based on the inventory available from the flower growers. And so that is your intellectual property, really, and uh, the source of your competitive advantage. So it's not always about trademarks or copyrights, but it can be sometimes that your intellectual property can be in the way that you design the business. And I think the relationships factor in, too, because I want that rose nobody else can have, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I, I would give it to somebody, you know? So I think those relationships are important, too. Do you have kind of a strategy outside distribution growth around product innovation? Are there other things that you think you can create to sell through this business? Um, We do believe that there is huge enterprise parts of our business in addition to -to direct-to-consumer. And we're exploring those right now. And we're also exploring some uh, retail concepts, too. So uh, more to come this year and next with It's By You. The website is itsbyu.com. This is really great. So if I go on your website, I can order one of these and try it. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Today. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So you are listening to Passage to Profit with Richard Elizabeth Gearhart and our special guest, Tony Bongrove. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearhart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at GearhartLaw.com. At Gearhart Law, we have years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at Gearheart Law, www.gearheartlaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W dot com. Together, we can change the world. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now more with Richard and Elizabeth. Passage to Profit. We've come to the end of our presentations this evening, and tonight we learned about how sometimes you can't always get the trademark you want right out of the bat. Sometimes you have to look at a lot of different trademarks and pick one that's available. And another thing that we learned about how, how important it is to enforce your trademarks and how to keep watching out there. If you have a really good mark, somebody else may want to take it. And so you got to pay attention and keep that trademark all to yourself. So remember, everyone, to go to the Passage to Profit page at GearHeartLaw.com and vote for your favorite project. So to summarize, we had Gil Barlev from Home Roots. Next, Kathleen Edinger pitched Teascapes, www.enjoyteascapes.com. And finally, Caroline Shoka pitched It's By You. So it's by you.com. That's great. And you can Google Passage to Profit and make your choice. Remember, you can only vote once, and you have until next Sunday at 7 p.m. to vote. This evening's pitch contestants will receive a Passage to Profit t-shirt, and the best overall vote-getter for the show will receive an Amazon gift card valued at $25. And before we sign off, I just want to say I really enjoyed this today. I mean, what is better than tea and flowers on nice furniture? (laughs) (laughs) That was very good the way you pulled all those things together. I would make Making a purse, a uh, silk purse out of a sow's ear, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we love hearing these pitches each week. Yeah, and I, I agree that the pitches were wonderful. And I want to say thanks again to our guest, Tony Vangrove. You took us over the top so many ways, Tony. Well, thanks for having me on the show. It was great. Uh, time. I really enjoyed it. And if anybody's interested in what I'm doing, um, my company's website is www.milesfinchinnovation.com. So we would like to thank our producer, Noah Fleischman, Rob, our engineer, and Kenya Gibson, our media maven, and the whole iHeart team. So don't forget to join us next week. You never know what you're going to hear on this show, but it will be excellent. And you can start thinking about what your pitch will be. And also start thinking about your intellectual property needs. And look us up on GearheartLaw.com. And don't forget to like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This is Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart on iHeartRadio with Passage to Profit. W-O-R-7-10, the voice of New York. 